Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Brian Kiley, and I have the pleasure of being the minister here. We hope that you will feel welcome here this morning. As Unitarian Universalists, we are bound together not by a common set of beliefs, but by our promise to support one another in our individual searches for truth and meaning, guided by our principles and drawing from many different sources. So we do hope that you will feel welcome here. Whatever you believe or don't believe, whomever you love, however you understand yourself and your gender, however you understand the idea of family, whatever your age or race or ability, you are welcome here. We invite you to join us in this journey of free thought, spiritual questing, and justice-making for as long as you feel comfortable doing so. We extend a special welcome to any of you who may be visiting for the first or second time this morning and invite you, please, to stay afterwards for coffee and conversation. We gather with gratitude this morning on traditional Cree lands that are now part of Treaty 6 territory, lands shared by many nations. We respect the histories, the languages, and the cultures of the indigenous peoples who have all called this land home from time to time and who enrich our vibrant community. Our community extends beyond the Sunday morning gathering, so please read the announcements in the order of service. We also have a monthly newspaper available in print and online, and it was just published on Friday. And you can join our virtual community on Facebook and Twitter to keep up to date in the happenings of our extended family. Now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let us let go just for a time of the everyday world. We'll silence our phones and devices, please, and we'll create space in this hour to simply be together. In the spirit of life and love, we gather. I'd like to begin the service today first by welcoming... Victoria Clark on cello and Darylin McCrosty on piano, our guest musicians from Orchestra Borealis, and invite them to offer us a prelude.
Thank you. The opening words today actually come from our hymn book. Today is the International Day of Transgender Awareness. So it seems fitting that the opening words be, Come, come, whoever you are. Wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving. Ours is no caravan of despair. So come. Yet again, come. I'd like to invite Ruth Marriott to come forward and light our chalice today. At times our own light goes out and is rekindled by the spark of another. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us. Our opening hymn this morning is about safety. Again, an appropriate theme on this transgender day. It's hymn number one, May Nothing Evil Cross This Door. I invite you to rise as you're willing or able in body or in spirit and join in singing. On Sunday mornings, I always check my mail and my news feeds, and I check Facebook just in case some great disaster has happened and I don't want to look silly not knowing about it. But today, the first thing that came up on my feed was a short reading from the Reverend Chris Rothbauer, who was an intern minister in Calgary three or four years ago and someone I got to know quite a bit. He wrote this, I am a gender. This means I am not a man or a woman, or any other gender for that matter. I do not disparage anyone who identifies as gendered. It's just that from my earliest memories, I never really synced with that M the doctor put on my birth certificate and the BMV on my driver's license. Cue picture of a three-year-old me delighting in both He-Man figures and Cabbage Patch dolls. And no, that did not make me a gender. It was just a shadow of things to come. Oh, sure, I'm red all the time as a man, but that doesn't mean I am one. Gender is not about what's between your legs. That would be too simplistic an explanation. Gender is about much more than how you present to the world. It's about who you are inside. Being non-binary, not a man or a woman, isn't easy in a culture that's only beginning to catch up with such language. I could endure the daily misgendering and misreading of my identity. I really could. However, when I see someone I thought was a friend casually dismissing or making fun of the idea that there are more than two genders, it hurts. They may not even realize that they're affecting me, but it stings nonetheless. 
So on this trans day of visibility, I raise a glass to all my trans, non-binary, agender, two-spirit, third gender, intersex, and otherwise gender transgressive siblings out there. May we one day live in a world where we're affirmed and loved for who we are. I'd like to invite our young people to come up and light their chalices, and then we will sing them out with something or another. I forgot to check. What you got, Gordon? 414. If you turn to hymn number 414 in our hymn book. This is the last day of our annual canvas, so I'd like to invite Ruth Marriott to come up and speak to that subject. Thank you, Brian. Good morning. As Brian said, my name is Ruth Marriott. Wow, it's the last day in March, and as uh, Brian said, the April newsletter is out. Um, I read it yesterday, and I was thinking, wow, what an exciting journey we've got, both short-term and long-term, in this church over the next little while. As you know, the theme for this year's Canvas has been supporting the journey. So it really um, drove it home when I wrote, when I read some of the things happening in the April newsletter. Last day of March, last Sunday in March, last Canvas Sunday. Andrew has given you updates and little canvas blurbs each of the canvas Sundays. And he couldn't be here today, so he asked me to give the update, probably because I'm a little bit of the canvas elf behind the scenes that tallies up pledges. As of yesterday, we had 71 pledges returned. As of this morning, 72. That's been a good response. But I checked, and last year, after the last Canvas Sunday, we were at 87 pledges returned, so I'm expecting there's still some more to come in, and I hope most of those will be coming in today by the time that I leave or through email at the end. Now, Andrew spoke at least a couple of times, mentioned about the aspect that our church is entirely self-supporting, and you've probably heard that in other services when we're taking the offering. And I'd like to tell you why this is so important to me that we're a self-supporting church. Firstly, it means we're not beholding to anybody for our funding. We don't rely on government funding, so we're independent from political pressures and from the winds of political change. Secondly, we We don't rely on grant funding, so our programs and our staffing is based on our available resources, including that raised during the canvas. We don't look at situations, unlike a lot of not-for-profits, where they're actually looking at cutting programs, even cutting staff, if their grant applications aren't successful. The other aspect of being self-supporting that's really important to me is we as a congregation call the shots. There's no hierarchy, there's no denomination that tells us when we call a minister, who, how long he or she stays, and when we decide to call a replacement. We as a congregation also decide our programs and our staff levels. We look at the resources available and our priorities, and we determine that as a congregation. The other aspect that's really important to me is that individually, we each decide how much we contribute to this self-supporting organization. Each of us looks at our financial circumstances and determines how much we think we can contribute to supporting the journey. If our financial circumstances change, all it takes is a con- an email or a phone call either to Andrew or to the church administrator, and that information is accepted and kept in strict confidence. 
So in supporting, in being entirely self-supporting, this is really special. We determine how much individually we give. I've been working on my husband and my income taxes, so I know that's one area where we don't determine how much we're going to contribute. And it's not the same for utilities or rent, anywhere else in, in our lives that I can think of. We have this special opportunity, and also collectively, we, we decide what our priorities are. So I hope that you will, if you haven't already returned a pledge, you'll use the form that was in your order of service or outside. Um, also on the form, you can fill in the form online through the link on the Canvas website, or you can simply send a one-line email to Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. Each week we take an offering to support the work of the congregation and also to support an outside organization. For the month of March, we have been supporting the International Council of Unitarians and Universalists. That's a, a body I had the uh, great pleasure and honor of heading for a few years that links Unitarians and Universalists from 40 countries around the world and all the continents except Antarctica. So we invite you to give generously, and we'll listen to another piece from our musicians.
Thank you. As we change pianists, we will prepare to receive the offering. I invite you to join in the song written in the order of service. Each Sunday we take some time to acknowledge that there are joys and consor joys and consoros. Oh, okay, that works. Joys and sorrows, concerns that touch our different lives. We do so by inviting anyone who wishes to do so to come up and light a candle for their particular joy and concern. And first I'm going to invite up those who wish to light a silent candle. But if you want to tell us why you're lighting your candle today, hold back and we'll give you an opportunity in a moment. So if you'd like to light a silent candle, please come forward now. If you'd like to share the reason for lighting a candle, please come forward now. These joys, these concerns do remind us that we're all part of one big human family, each with our own particular pieces of happiness and problem and stresses. It's important to remember that in this world, there's always, in every face you look at, there's always something going on, something happy, something sad, something scary. So be kind to one another. Amen. This poem by Marge Piercy spoke to me this week as I was finishing my sermon. Connections are made slowly. Sometimes they grow underground. You cannot tell always by looking what is happening. More than half a tree is spread out in the soil under your feet. Penetrate quietly as earthworm that blows no trumpet. Fight persistently as the creeper that brings down the tree. Spread like the squash plant that overruns the garden. Gnaw in the dark and make use of the sun to make sugar. Weave real connections. Create real nodes. Build real houses. Live a life you can endure. Make love that is loving. Keep tangling and interweaving and taking more in a thicket and bramble wilderness to the outside, but to us interconnected with rabbit runs and burrows and layers. Live as if you like yourself, and it may happen. Reach out. Keep reaching out. Keep bringing in. This is how we are going to live for a long time. Not always. For every gardener knows that after the digging, after the planting, after the long season of tending and growth, the harvest comes. So I like to pose a community question each week. And as we think about the theme of journey, the service today is about evolving nation. So what I want you to do, invite you to do, gather in twos, threes, groups of 27, and talk for two or three minutes about how is this world of ours evolving? Are we going in a good direction? Are we going in a bad direction? Where is your heart when you think about where we have been and where we are going?
Well, I'm betting that this conversation re remained on a highly philosophical plane and not one person mentioned the election we're experiencing. <laughs> I'd like to invite you to, to join with me in hopefully finishing positively on this question with hymn number 121, We'll Build a Land. One, two, one. <laughs> I have this very fond memory of childhood. My dad and I would go to the grocery store and come home with wonderful crispy lettuce, green onions you could smell from across the room, and tomatoes bright red and bursting with flavor. And my mom would take these, for we lived in a very traditional home, my mom would take these and produce wonderfully flavorful salads with a fragrance of garlic that she rubbed around the old wooden salad bowl. And the taste seemed so alive. You just don't get salad like that today. What's missing from that memory is how those salads were mostly only served in late July and August and September. Strawberry shortcake belonged to June and maybe July. Fresh blueberries only appeared in July and August. In the other months of those 1960s years, they mostly featured canned or frozen vegetables, except for the earthy ones like carrots, potatoes, turnips, and parsnips. You see, we pretty much only got those flavorful delights when they were actually growing nearby. 
the technology and transport capacity to bring in produce from places where they grow year-round just hadn't been developed back then. And while there are lots of legitimate concerns with long-distance transportation and preservative chemistry and factory farming, a lot of people forget just how restricted our diets were 60 years ago. Even in a large grocery store, the produce shelf was seldom more than 10 meters long. Our eating expectations have evolved as technical advances have provided more choices, even if they aren't quite as fresh and tasty. Most human beings thinking about the past tend to remember only what was good. What wasn't so good shrinks in size and takes up less and less of our memory over time. It's like pain. It's very hard for our bodies to actually remember what physical pain feels like once it's truly gone away. We remember that we felt pain, but we can't bring it back and feel it again, which is probably a good thing. Probably why some people get hangovers again and again and again. And perhaps that's why some people love to proclaim that everything has gone to hell and we would be better off returning to a long-ago way of doing things. The past is tinted with a rosy glow that often really wasn't as bright as we remember it. We cherry-pick the good moments of the past and we ignore the rest. Perhaps that's why we so often fail to learn the lessons history has to offer. As we survive through the silly season of election campaigns, we would do well to remember the lessons of history. Our nation has evolved, I believe, for the better an awful lot over my lifetime. Consider these facts. Federally mandated universal health care only became the law in 1968. Before that, some Canadians could and did go bankrupt from her doctor bills or simply left conditions untreated. I just spent a week at a retirement seminar with about 30 American UU minister colleagues, and the largest single anxiety about that group wasn't poverty, it was health care. How would they be able to continue or replace their health benefits upon retirement, especially if they had one or more of those infamous pre-existing conditions? The average unsubsidized American pays ten to $12,000 a year in health insurance, and even then they can expect a four to $5,000 deductible. And now the administration is fighting to remove millions of, from the roles of the insured. One of my colleagues faces the choice of absolute poverty or increasingly unbearable pain in her declining years because she will almost certainly be uninsurable. Canadians complain about wait times in emergency rooms and for elective surgeries, justifiably, but we will get treated and we won't be financially broken by the treatments. Americans have three years less less life expectancy than we have. Were it not for the Health Care Act of 1968, we might well be in the same position. Our nation has evolved. In 1968, Franco-Albertans in trouble with the law had no hope of a trial in their mother tongue. French only became an official language in 1969. Now they can access all federal and provincial services in French. In the 1960s, residential schools were still only just being phased out. And though in many places that program was replaced by the infamous 60s scoop. Today, many institutions and levels of government are working with commitment on truth and reconciliation. Many of my American colleagues commented on it because they've noticed. Our nation is evolving. As I mentioned last week, Canada only began relaxing immigration restrictions on people from Asian societies in the late 1960s. 
The Royal Commission on the Status of Women met for the first time in 1967. Today, half of our federal cabinet posts are taken up by women, and of course our premier here in Alberta is a woman as well. Same-sex marriages and medical assistance in dying are now legal, and transgender persons can get the surgeries they need if they so wish. Our nation is evolving. What's important to remember is that none of these changes happened overnight. Our social safety net took decades to evolve. Our sense of multiculturalism was and still is a long, slow arc of change towards justice. Our comprehension of the impact of our colonizing past has dawned so very slowly that it remains a national point of shame. But even this is finally being addressed, though with agonizing slowness. Still, I sometimes find myself getting vexed at those who are impatient about the pace of change. Any step forward is seldom celebrated for very long. Instead, it's supposed to be the beginning of the next step, something to be taken immediately because any remaining justice, injustice, is justice denied. Yeah, that's true. But sometimes it's wise to give those who oppose the forward stride a little bit of time to catch up. There is wisdom in letting change become normalized before we start climbing the next hill. It's fine for activists to want to remain keen and concerned and committed, but I think they would have more support for their cause by stepping back just a little after a win. You see, real change only happens over time. I want to suggest a constructive example for your consideration. Medical assistance in dying has been something I've actively supported and worked on for over 30 years. Others worked on it much, much longer than that. Along with a few other people, I helped craft the CUC's policy supporting choice in dying options over 25 years ago. And you may not know that Dying with Dignity once shared an office with the CUC for a long time before that. I used to have long chats with Marilyn Seguin, one of the organization's founders in that tiny Toronto office. She was my teacher. We knew back then how sensitive the issue was. So we worked on education and taking small incremental steps like improving access to palliative care, enshrining the right to refuse treatment or have others refuse it on our behalf, both in law and, more importantly, in the minds and hearts of the doctors and the nurses who served us. DWD patiently brought court cases based on human right concerns and shared evidence from other jurisdictions that were more progressive. In short, they understood that this would be an evolutionary shift and they would have to wait for society to catch up with each stride they made. Well, society did. The law has been changed. And still the leaders know that the new law only goes part way. A long part, but only part way. And there are still further steps to be taken, some barriers to overcome, and yes, some terribly thorny ethical and moral decisions yet to be resolved. Though a long-time advocate, even I'm not sure I can go all the way with what's being discussed, at least not yet. But I know I'm going to have a good amount of time to think about it. The thing is, you don't hear all that much about choice in dying right now. They know how much they've achieved and how long it took. So the conversation about what's next is low-key and mostly amongst themselves. The issues are being discussed, but not with anger or frustration, or not much. They understand that first, Canada has to get used to the new state of being. Canadians have to see the impacts and the effects of the new world of medical assistance in dying. It's going to take time for the country to learn that the dire, slippery slope predictions of opponents 
have not come true and won't. The time for further action will come when Canadians are ready for the next debate. And then another potential human rights court case will arise and the MAID supporters will present it. Our nation is evolving. Over my lifetime, I've attended many protests on all kinds of different issues. And I have angrily joined in that popular chant you hear time and time again. What do we want? Insert your cause. When do we want it? Now! It might be that once upon a time a demanded social change did come about shortly after that now, but I certainly don't remember it ever happening. Connections are made slowly, writes Marge Piercy. I'm not devaluing or uh, opposing protests. I do think they are an important tool in pushing society along the evolutionary curve. And I really rather enjoy them, especially when they're in nice weather. But this is how we have to think about it, in my view, that change is evolutionary rather than immediate. The demand for startling and rapid change can get tripped up by the law of unintended consequences. And one of those consequences is likely to be a defensive backlash and an entrenching of opposition views. I think we saw this with the spectacular arrival of the Me Too movement. Though the intention of stopping sexual harassment and abuse of power is laudable, the rush to judgment that occurred following some of the first public accusations might have actually harmed more than helped the cause. As the researchers Strauss and Blanton observed about language, if language reform is sufficient to promote more tolerant attitudes and beliefs, then the backlash against such reform might just as easily promote less tolerant attitudes and beliefs. Peaceful protest changes mind, but usually only a few people at a time. They might have a faster effect on people who already lean in that general direction, but who haven't really thought about the particular issue. But the tidal waves of change often cause the skeptics to hunker down and resist. They close their minds to even the possibility of change and cannot be persuaded. However, on the positive side, the process of evolution speeds up as consciousnesses are raised. So these kinds of public activities are important. We do need to talk about the issues, but I think we need to do so with a measure of generosity and even patience. Our First Nations people have waited long, long time for justice. But it seems to me that they never really stop trying or stop negotiating. They understood that change is a very slow process. Well, yeah, we are in the midst of a federal or of a provincial election. Federal will be next fall. One developing is the most bitterly contested event in living memory. It is nasty out there. Generosity and patience in the public sphere are pretty much non-existent. There are certainly different policy approaches in play in this election, but sadly, they're not really debated or even discussed. Instead, we get sound bites written in a way to stir up the already committed and maybe play to the interests of the still uncommitted, if there are any in this province. So they're saying, our pottery is going to give you this thing you want, and those other folks won't. In fact, they're going to tear up all that is good and wonderful about our glorious province and its glowing red rosy past. What's ignored is that policy can't be implemented overnight. Our current government learned a few years ago that what they thought was a real simple fix to health and safety rules on farms just wasn't simple at all. They had to backtrack and rework it. There were simply too many interconnected threads for it to be simple, but they got it done. Should they be elected, the opposition party will soon learn that repealing the carbon tax or cutting middle management in order to reduce wait times in hospitals will be far more complicated than they imagine. 
Well, they probably know. I'll say far more complicated than they're admitting. We Unitarian Universalists affirm that we are part of an interconnected web of all existence. Well, a version of the same web exists within the structures of government, economy, healthcare, environment, and education. They are all tied together. Pull on one thread and the whole web reverberates. Wishing that it was all as easy or as returning to what we wrongly remember as simpler times decades ago is short-sighted and false. And if leaders are proclaiming it, they are being misleading. Believing that whatever we want to protest, we can have the day after the election is naive and it's wrong. It's a lie. Just ask Mr. Trump about his first day in office promises, about his wall and the repeal of Obamacare. Connections are made slowly. Amen. I'd like to invite you into a time of meditation as we sing hymn number 391, Voice Still and Small. Please remain seated. Let us embrace the silence.
Our closing hymn this morning is number 128, For All That Is Our Life. 128. The service is ended, the chalice is extinguished, but its light lives on in the minds and the hearts and the souls of each one of you. So carry it with you when you leave this place and share it with those you know, with those you love, and most especially with those you've yet to meet. It's our tradition to join hands and sing, carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. I believe that was for you. It wasn't for me. Thank you so much for being with us. For the rest of you, we have a couple of announcements, if you'd hang on for just a sec. Thanks to all of our volunteers who are here today, and especially to our guest musicians.